Well, good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. And if you didn't bring a Bible with you today, you'll find Bibles in the chair pockets around you. Exodus chapter 33. We'll be starting in verse 7. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for all who have gathered here this morning in order by their presence to acknowledge that you are God. We have come here today, Father, to worship, acknowledging that you are the creator and we are the creatures, Lord, that we have a dependence upon you for life, breath, and all things, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the great gift of your Son who has made a relationship with you possible, for the blood he shed on the cross in atonement for our sins. We thank you, Father, for the moving of your Holy Spirit in our lives that we might come to know and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And we thank you, Father, for the fellowship that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ because of Jesus, that we have been born again as the children of God. Father, I pray that you would receive our praises and our prayers this morning. I pray that our hearts would be focused on you, that you would teach us from your word, and that you would set a guard over my lips that I might speak those things that are right and true. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Exodus 33, verse 7. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. This might seem like simply a description of Moses setting up a tent outside of the area in which the people of Israel were camped so that the people would be able to go out there and spend time with God. But in reality, there's much more meaning packed into what we're being told here. Just before this, in Exodus 32, the incident with the golden calf had taken place. Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai with Joshua to receive the Ten Commandments from God. And while he was gone, the people had convinced Aaron, Moses' brother, to make an idol for them, a golden calf that they could worship. The golden calf was supposed to represent God. If you go back to Exodus 32, verse 7, you'll see God's reaction to this and the dialogue that occurs between him and Moses. Exodus 32, 7 begins, And the Lord said to Moses, Go get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed... It is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. 
Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I've spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. After this, Moses and Aaron go back down the mountain carrying the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written. And when Moses actually sees what's taking place, which was basically a drunken orgy centered around this idol of the golden calf, he becomes furious. He smashes the Ten Commandments, burns the golden calf and grounds it into powder and then sprinkles the powder into the water and forces the people to drink it. The next day, Exodus 32, 30 tells us, Moses returned to the Lord and again interceded on behalf of the people, asking for God's forgiveness and that God would not destroy the people because of their sin. And God didn't destroy them, though he did let Moses know that there would be consequences for their sin and that the relationship between himself and Israel was not going to be the same. Exodus 33, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Those are people currently living in the land. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Verse 3 is the key part of this passage that helps us understand the significance of what we're being told in verse 7 when Moses sets up the tent, the tent outside of the camp. In verse 3 we're told where God says, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. We actually looked at this passage in a sermon a few weeks ago referring to it. I will not go up in your midst. God told Moses. A reversal of the way in which God had dealt with the people up to this point. So Moses took his tent and pitched it outside of the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting, verse 7 tells us. By the way, this isn't the tabernacle that contains the Ark of the Covenant that God will later instruct Moses to make, beginning in Exodus chapter 35, verse 10. This tabernacle had actually been Moses' tent, which he now uses as this tabernacle of meeting, and which he places outside of the camp, far from the camp, as an indication of the separation that now exists between the Lord and the people of Israel. So that now, God no longer dwells in the midst of the people. He's outside the camp, and now God relates only to those who want to relate to Him, as opposed to being the God of all the people of Israel. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp, verse 7 goes on to tell us. And then verse 8 continues, So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he'd gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So Moses 
continued to have a close relationship with God. In fact, a very close relationship with God. That's what we're being told in verse 11 when we're told that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Though when the passage tells us that Moses spoke to God face to face, that doesn't mean that Moses knew God in all of his fullness. We know this because later in the same chapter in verse 18, Moses asks to see God's glory and God answers that while he reveal more of who he is to Moses, you cannot see my face, God says in verse 20, for no one shall see me and live. So when we're told in verse 11 that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, we're being told about the intimacy of Moses' relationship with the Lord. That God was relating to Moses directly rather than simply speaking through dreams or visions as God had spoken to others. And as for the people of Israel... They could only watch from a distance. The pillar of cloud, which had been a manifestation of God's presence and which had led them from Egypt to Mount Sinai, now only appears when Moses goes into the tabernacle of meeting. It only appears outside the camp, far from the camp, verse 7 tells us. And that's really quite sad when you think about it like the break in a relationship between friends. There's a distance now where there didn't used to be, and a longing that things could be different like they were before, but you're not sure they ever will be again. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie La La Land. That was one of the Academy Award nominees for Best Picture several years ago. But there's a scene at the end of that movie that's very much like this. Most of the movie is about the relationship between Sebastian, a jazz pianist who dreams of owning his own club one day, and Mia, an aspiring actress. The two fall in love, have a typical on-again, off-again relationship, and then go their separate ways because of the inability of reconciling their different dreams. Sebastian eventually gets his jazz club, and Mia becomes a success successful actress and marries somebody else. Toward the end of the movie, Mia and her husband have finished eating dinner at a restaurant, and as they're walking down the street, they hear music from a club and decide to go in. Unknown to Mia, it's Sebastian's jazz club. And after she and her husband sit down at a table, Sebastian comes on stage. He glances out at the audience and sees Mia, then sits down at the piano, pauses for a moment, and begins to play a song that he had composed while they were dating. And as he plays, an alternative reality shows on the movie screen of the life they might have had together if they'd made different choices. Sebastian finishes his song. Mia's husband asks her if she wants to stay. She says no. They get up from the table and head for the door, but just before she goes outside, Mia stops and looks back at Sebastian. Their eyes meet, a few seconds pass, and then she turns and walks away. Sebastian looks back down at the piano keys, gathers himself for a few seconds, and then begins to play again. It really is a melancholy ending, as each sees the other from a distance and remembers for a moment what they once had. And that's sort of what I sense here in verse 8 when we're told, So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he'd gone into the tabernacle. Each man stood at his tent door and watched from a distance. And yet in this instance, the possibility of reconciliation is still there. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp, we're told at the end of verse 7. So God's still open to a relationship with the people, but they have to want the relationship enough to come out to the tabernacle of meeting. And there is another besides Moses who does want that relationship, who has that relationship, but he wants it to be even closer. 
I want you to notice again what we're told in verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Joshua wanted to stay with God. Even when Moses had left, Joshua wanted to stay. And do you realize how revealing that is of Joshua's heart and of his desire to know God? The Apostle Paul tells us the natural man does not desire the things of God. Instead, the natural man, like his ancestor Adam, is quite content to hide from God and remain apart from Him. The natural man is only too happy for God to be outside the camp so that God is the one, as with Adam who must always initiate contact. That desire to spend time with God as opposed to that sense that we ought to spend time with God is therefore an evidence of God's grace at work within us. Which doesn't mean that the choice to spend time with God because we ought to spend time with God is always a wrong motivation. Sometimes love acts out of a sense of obligation because the relationship means something. Because the relationship is valued over the desires we sometimes have to act in ways inconsistent with the relationship. But at the same time, a relationship primarily motivated by obligation instead of desire, by a sense of ought to instead of a sense of want to, isn't truly a relationship whose foundation is love. You may remember a few weeks ago when I told you about a man named John who would stop by a church every day near dusk on his way home from work. A construction worker, often dirty or at least dusty and obviously tired. But he'd still stop by the church every work day and sit quietly in the back for five to ten minutes. And then he'd get up and leave. So the pastor who'd seen him do this every work day, day after day, month after month, approached him one day as he was leaving and told him that he was glad that John could come by the church every day. John thanked the pastor, telling him that this was an important time for him. And the pastor asked him, why was it important? And John replied that this was his time for a more intentional focus on Jesus. I just come in, sit down, and say, Jesus, it's John. What happens then, the pastor asked. Well, he replied, Jesus says, John, it's Jesus, and we're just happy to spend some time together. We're happy to just spend some time together. And isn't that always the case with the people that you love? Maybe you don't even have to say very much. Just being with them is enough. The conversation doesn't have to be forced. As I was first reading about John and the few minutes he gave every day to spend time with Jesus because the relationship meant something to him, it made me think about my dad and the rounds to visit people that he used to make every day to see my mamma, who was his mother, then over to see his brothers, Roger, Dale, or Charlie. Then as he came back up the road, he'd stop to visit his uncle Clayton or his cousin Dwayne, and then drive by the post office to pick up the mail and talk to all the people who were gathered there. The trip was supposedly just to get the mail, (laughs) but this is what Dad did on his way to get the mail. He wouldn't stay necessarily a long time at any one location. He'd just drop by, spend a few minutes, and then move on. And yet that time he spent was enough to show that the relationships that he wanted to spend time with, with these people, mattered. And that's what I think we're being told about Joshua in the verse we read. His servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. He wanted to spend time with God. Maybe he wasn't even praying. Maybe he was just sitting there, meditating. He wanted to stay in the tabernacle even after Moses had left. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Let's pray.
You know, have you ever had those relatives or friends that maybe you haven't seen in months or maybe even a few years? And you get together, and it's like almost no time has passed. That familiarity is still there. It's because these are people you know, people you love, people who have a special place in your heart. Sometimes you can even be going someplace with them and you don't even have to talk. It's just enough to be there, sitting with them. That's when you know the relationship is close. When you don't have to force conversation. When just being in the presence of another person is enough. And I pray that one day that's what our relationship with the Lord will be like. Simply being in his presence is enough. And perhaps like John in the story that I mentioned to you earlier, we'll be content to just take a few minutes to be alone with Jesus. Because he matters. So I want you to ask God to help you come to that place where you have that kind of a relationship that Moses had where the Lord can speak to you as a man speaks to his friend. The kind of relationship that Joshua had where when you have those times with the Lord, you don't really want to leave. You want to just stay there with him. It really is all about love. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God, has known agape love forever. He created in order that others might share in that love. He loves us and he wants us to love him. And so ask God to help you grow in your knowledge and love of God and to make the choice to spend time with him. Even if it's just a few minutes a day. Make the choice to spend time with him because the relationship matters. And while you're talking with God about this, maybe you're with us this morning and you haven't yet come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. The Bible tells us that the only way fallen human beings, sinful human beings, can have a relationship with the Holy God is through Jesus. And that's because the problem between human beings and a holy God is our sin. And try as best we can, we can't clean up our lives. We can't make ourselves sinless. And so because God loves us, he made a way. God the Son took on human flesh, came into our world as one of us, lived a sinless life, tempted it always as we are, the Bible tells us, yet without sin. And then Jesus gave that sinless life and sacrifice on the cross in payment for our sins. That we might be forgiven, cleansed, born again, have a relationship with God. And so if you're here this morning and you understand that you are a sinner who stands in need of forgiveness, and you understand that the way to that forgiveness is Jesus, who died for you on the cross and was raised from the dead the third day, then the ball's in your court. All you need to do is ask. And so if you'd like to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord today, if you would raise your hand, I will lead you in a prayer of commitment. I'll pray the words aloud. You can repeat them silently to God right where you are. All you need to do is raise your hand.
Father God, I thank you that you want an intimate relationship with us. I thank you, Father, that you want us to know you. I thank you, Father, that you have shown us what love looks like in the person of your Son. What would it have been like to walk with Jesus? To walk with God become flesh? To walk in the presence of agape love? And that that's what we're being invited to have, Lord. A relationship with God. A God of love. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room and myself that we would truly appreciate that relationship. That we would grow in that relationship. That we would understand that all the other things we are wanting are just covers for our greatest need, which is you. And Father, I pray for any in this room who haven't yet truly trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that you would move in their lives, Father, to draw them to you. That they would come to the place where they truly would want Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to know more about us, you can find us on the web at wpbcmd.org and on Facebook at White Plains Baptist Church 1978.